All right, uh, we're coming to order. Um, Town of Sethro, Sethro Library Board of Trustees, September 2nd, 1 p.m. It's actually 1.10 when we're beginning. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law 30, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order, and supposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the South Pearl Library Board of Trustees will be conducted by a remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information in the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the Town of Southborough website at httpsouthboroughtown.com. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to listen to the meeting may do so in the following manner. Same drill, southboroughtown.com remote meetings. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so despite best efforts, we will put, it says pot, but all right. We will put on South Rose website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. All right, number one, we brew, review and approve the minutes of the meeting of July 22, 2020. Any emendations or corrections? Just have a question on the times. Um, this is pedantic, uh, but at the top it says, 6.01 p.m. and the meeting was called to order at 4.09 p.m. Or either of those need to be changed? I wasn't at the meeting, so I don't know. But thank you for pointing that out. It was Not a big deal. I have, a, I have a second pedantic question. And that has to do with the, um, well, it's the expense report, which actually is, I guess, is not technically part of the minutes. But the, um, the expense report says at the top, fiscal year 2019, then it says July 30th, 2020. Um, I, can, so, I can speak to that. The okay. a macro in the expense report document that auto updates the date. So anytime you open the document, it readjusts it to that date. This okay. This has caused confusion in the past. I think it might be helpful if I just remove that. So the document when it's dated is the actual date that you guys are reading versus the date changing okay. uh, every time you open the document. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That'll be a good change, I think. Because yeah, that's caused confusion before, yeah. Right. And for people who do the minutes, I'm looking at you, Jane, uh, that I know that has been that's know, been something documents yeah. are dated correctly and then it's my fault so i okay. i apologize i'll fix it okay okay so um and you. and the other correction about the hour that it started what, when did it start six or four i think it was six wasn't it it was, it was six yes all right oh, be six right. thank you david good catches pedantic i'll change <laughs> it i'll change it and resubmit it okay all right. Um, so uh, I move to approve the minutes as amended. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We, we need yep. to do all. Everybody has to say their name. Yeah. OK, Landry, aye. Yes, Donnie, aye. Regan, aye. Mandy, aye. 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 Sorry. Davis, aye. Uh, passes unanimously. All right. Um, Oh, just a second. Um, Kim, you had an idea for how we should, so we are not all voting over each other. Didn't we kind of, didn't you have an idea for that? Oh, I think we were just talking about just going in alphabetical order and just having the same rotation if yeah. we want that makes that. sense. So just for the record, it would be Jane Davis. I was going to say, then yeah. Steven, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Marguerite, Janet, and then um, yeah. uh, Kim and then Amy, okay? okay. I lost so, the back for a second there. Sorry, I've been running up and down stairs. So okay. yeah. happy to be sitting. And Marguerite, are you motioning or seconding? So we do it in the same order for- I, um, moved, you, I moved you seconded, how's that? That's fine, just wanna be sure. All right, so uh, approved as, approved, minutes are approved as amended. All right, number two, agenda item reports discussion. This will be Ryan. The first thing up is the director's report. 
So if, if the board would indulge me, I feel like we, we do this every time, but we have a guest. So our, our operating project manager has been moved up as a panelist and that's uh, Mary Bolso who's joining us. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to move to um, the agenda item D in section two so that we, oh, I'm sorry, into agenda item B in section two and talk about the facade restoration project right now. And then we'll move on to the director's report after. Is that Sounds okay? Good. Yep. All right. Okay. I'll take over Ryan. Thank you. So um, just to update everybody, we did have um, our bids have come in. They were extremely favorable. Our estimate was about 740,000. The total bid cost came in at 685,000. Calhess Restoration and Waterproofing was the low bidder. Um, both myself and Spencer Sullivan and Vote checked references and Spencer Sullivan has had successful projects with them in the past. So we are recommending that Calhess be awarded as the low bidder. Um, and just to explain a little bit about the bidding, I don't know if Ryan shared these sheets with you that I have. So we had multiple bids yeah. for roofing and masonry, um, which was pretty good. We had an extremely competitive market there. So the way it works is the GC picks from those lists who they want for the masonry and roofing. In Mass General Law, anything that we estimate over $25,000 for certain trades like masonry and roofing have their own bid package. So those bids came in previously and then the GC selects those. So, What's the GC, Mary? The general contractor, they run the whole project. Okay, thank you. And they are allowed to set what they call self-perform, which means do some of the work themselves. So in this case, Cal Hess actually is a mason also, and he will uh -huh. be doing the masonry and waterproofing himself. All right. And then Greenwood Roofing is the low roofing bidder that they selected to do the roofing scope. They, um, once their contract is on board, we have their draft bonds have already been submitted for review to uh, Mr. Purple and I believe your town attorney, Aldo. So everything is in order. Once you make the motion or a vote to award, we can get the contract signed and get them moving. In the meantime, they have already reached out because they need to finish this project within 120 days. We want to be done before, you know, the real winter weather. So they're trying to get us moving. Um, they awarded on the 14th and we still don't have a contract. So we're losing valuable time. So as a result, they have started submitting the materials they're going to use for masonry mortar and those types of items. And probably early next week, you will see some activity out there doing a mock-up. Um, for those of you non-trade people, the mock-up is where they show an example of their work to get a level of acceptance accepted by the um, architect, the color, the match, the, um, the technique, the skill set. And that's important for the, you know, the masonry to look the same as it does now. So that will be starting next week and hopefully we'll be starting the roof soon after that. Does anybody have questions on the bid process or how this moves forward? No, what do you need from us? I, I, have, a I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Um, I just wondered, it seemed like the, the top or the one that you guys chose was substantially less than the others. I mean, there was a huge range in those prices um, uh, on some, well, from the yeah, top me, to the bottom, it appeared. So the next one was classic construction and they were at 718. So that is about, you know, 20,000 or so more. But I will tell you, both Calhassie and Classic Construction have no work. Well, I know Classic is finishing up two projects right now and they are hungry for work. We're seeing- No, I, is that what you think? Well, I just meant like from the 685 to like the 959, um, right. is this a locked in price that they can't come back and be it like, is. oh, okay. Like, there may just... be change orders if we find an unforeseen condition and we do have okay. a contingency for that. So some of the higher ones, um, that I spoke to, they made an assumption of the scope um, for more copper and that's what threw them off. Okay. Because um, I did talk to, to find out why they were so high. Yeah. Um, but Cal, you know, like I said, Cal has, has a, a great reputation. They've been doing this a while. Um, and I think it's a factor of the COVID. A lot of towns yeah. did just basic town meeting, took all the capital projects off. That's why we would never see these, this, this number of bidders and some of these higher names from Boston, like Folan, 
waterproofing and um, Louis Algarong normally wouldn't look at a project this size. Okay. So, and, and Amy, it's not unusual in bidding that I've seen in my time watching it for to see quite a quite a difference in the number. Right. As you probably know from. I just wanted to be sure we weren't, you know, like when you yeah. do your house and the lowest bid comes in. Yeah. And then suddenly they can't do it for that which they've torn the place up. So I just wanted to see how that That's why know. we have that's why we have Mary. She's exactly. our, she's our no. guard dog. Good. <laughs> they, are, they are tied to it and we do check with the lower bidder always. There have been cases where the lower bidder has missed something substantially and we let them walk away because it does no good for anybody. Yeah, right. Exactly. So okay. thank thank you. This is the first, my first go round on yes, these no big problem. things. I have a question. Um, the Greenwood Jane. roofing, I, this is probably a dumb question, but is it, it, they are doing the roof. Is that what you said? Is, yes, they will do that... the roof and they will be monitored and controlled by Cal Hess. They work, Cal Hess has the contract with the roofer. The town oh. the library will have the contract with Cal Hess. Okay, so they're the general contractor yes. and all the other things. Fall. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have a question. Is there a contingency built into this number? Yes, there is. It's about 10%. It's in our estimate. It's in what was appropriated by the town, okay. not by the bidder. So now there's even more money based on the appropriation, but whatever's not spent, this isn't a shopping spree. We have a certain scope that was voted on. Okay. If we run into an unforeseen condition, it will come out of that money. Anything left goes back to the town. So the 10% isn't part of the bid, but is no. in our budget, right? It's in your budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Do we need to vote to approve any of this or are you just reporting to us? No, you do need to vote to approve and then someone has to sign it. Is Ryan, right. is that correct? Is the library trustees that sign this? Okay, I think, I think Ryan wants to talk about that. Okay. So we, we, moving forward, Mary and I will still come to do, it's really Mary, uh, to do reports on this um, in future meetings. And just to give updates on the project, but we need to assign like an individual to sign um, some of the bid contract documents. So typically when something like this comes up, it's the chair, but that's for you guys to discuss. Uh, Mary and I would recommend that we um, give somebody signing authority. So you'd have to make a motion and then vote to approve that. I'm okay with being the signatory if it's okay with everybody else. Good for me. Sure. Okay. So, uh, do you want? Do I need to motion to vote on that then? Yes. Why don't you will reverse? Okay. <laughs> I motion that uh, Margarita is our designated signature for this process. All right. Second. All in favor, starting with Jane. Jane. Right. Jane. Uh, Jane Davis. I. Eckberg. I. Landry. I. Maney. I. Regan, aye. Yes, Donnie, aye. Uh, passes unanimously. Okay, the second discussion, I think, Ryan, do you want to take that one up about um, the whole project, right? Don't we need to vote to approve what Mary just presented yeah. to us? Yes, the bid and whatever. Right, so right. does anybody want to make a motion to approve? Well, technically, because they just, um, they just, gave you the authority to sign the bids, you can yep. sign the bids. They don't, you don't need to have a separate vote to authorize the bids because Marguerite can just sign them now. What however, we, however, just in the interest of making it totally yes. non convertible yeah. I, would, I would like to move that we accept the bids that Mary Balso presented to us today. I second. And the amount of 685. Thank yep. you. Okay. Yep. So first vote is Jane. All in favor, uh, Jane. Davis, aye. Eckberg, aye. Uh, Landry, aye. Manny, aye. Regan, aye. Yes, Donnie, aye. Okay, passes unanimously. All right. Mary, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, director's report then, Ryan. <clears throat> Mary, are you, you can, you're welcome to stay, but I don't think we need you for anything else if you... Okay, if you're sure, there's no more questions. I don't want to leave anybody hanging. Anybody got questions? Not trying to kick you out. I no, I know. No, we've all got things to do, so... 
All right. Well, you'll see me out there next week with the Masons. All okay. right. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And if you guys think of any questions for Mary after the meeting, I can put you in touch directly, or I'm happy to pass along any questions. There, there are no dumb questions when it comes to this. This is all new to us. Mary's the, um, you know, the expert we hired, the manager uh, for the project. So if there's any questions that come up, um, that's what she's there for. So, okay. Uh, give me a sec. I'm gonna pull up my own report. <laughs> Did anybody have any questions about the director's report before we get started? There is, there was some stuff in there. No. You're probably going to talk about this, but I'm just curious about uh, the possibility of uh, having to di dismiss staff. Uh, uh, line four of the second second bullet point. Yeah. Um, any any update on that? Is, is that going to be likely or unlikely? I, I still don't know. So the answer is I don't know. What I can tell you is there have been projects in the past that when we do do capital improvements. What we try to do is work within a different area of the building that is not under construction. But as you can imagine, if construction is taking place at the library, there can be a safety concern. So for most of the flood, for example, when they were doing um, the remediation work and then the reconstruction work, the library staff was able to work upstairs in the building. But when they were gluing down the carpet, um, even though we are assured that the smell was not toxic, mm -hmm. the smell was so strong that the staff were not able to, um, to really be in the building. It was just too pervasive. And then we even were trying to, because um, we were open to the public during that time, they came upstairs. People would, I'm not kidding, open the door and then leave. Like they wouldn't <laughs> even walk in the building. So, th so that just kind of gives you an idea. So... We would, not, um, we would not dismiss staff unless we have to. We would not shut down curbside pickup operations unless we had to and it was recommended. When the boiler is installed, it's very likely that the children from staff will have to work upstairs or in the teen room. So we're kind of figuring out um, how that would work. T uh, John, unfortunately, doesn't have um, the time frame for the work that will really help inform exactly how long this is going to be a, a potentially a problem. Um, he doesn't anticipate that either installation is going to be more than a couple days. And as he always does, he's going to try to target a bulk of the work before the library opens. So hopefully that will minimize the disruption. But I'm, I'm just letting you know, full time, we, in the event that we do have to send the staff home, the full-time staff gets paid, the part-time staff does not, because um, they typically only work for hours work. So um, uh, now that we we have experience doing remote projects, it's very likely that the full-time staff will engage in remote work for that period of time. So they'll write some book recommendations for the website. They've already kind of um, been sort of working on that in the background and curbside has been so busy that um, we don't often get the chance to do that. So. That's sort of the plan, if that makes sense. We don't think the boiler is going to cause um, staff to have to get dismissed. It's mainly the EMS system because we can't have staff work if they take out the HVAC and the air handler. Um, it's specifically more the air handler. We need to have ventilation in the building right now because of the pandemic. So does that make sense? Yes, thank you. I talked a lot. Sometimes I worry I don't answer people's questions when that happens. So I hope, I hope I did, David. So the answer to the question was you're not sure yet. Yes. The, okay. the question is I don't know. <laughs> okay. I will, what I will do is I will send you guys updates um, if I get more information. So if that occurs before the next meeting. At this point, I don't know when it's going to be installed. We might have another meeting before this work gets done, in which case I'll have an update. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, even though it didn't make the director's report, I did want to just give a, a quick update about the copy machine. The update is that there is no update. <laughs> that's, that's what I think, you guys. And just that it's, we're continuing to work on it. We are um, involving Brian Ballantine, the town's finance director, just in reviewing some of the um, 
the uh, cloud contracts. It turns out there's a separate thing if you're going to take credit cards and he has experience doing that. So he is assisting Tom and I. So the bulk of the work is on Tom and Brian at this point, because I signed the initial contracts and then we're just still trying to schedule a delivery date for the copy machine. So that we still don't have a copy machine. We've been successfully able to work around that um, with our vendors. Mainly what we copied were invoices for books. So we either have invoices emailed to us or we've requested a second invoice from the vendor and we've been able to um, successfully manage that over the past couple months. Okay. Uh, you guys all know about the, the broken sign. So we got yes. one sign fixed and then another sign broken. Incredible. Um, <laughs> That, so that's in the director's report. We are waiting to um, coordinate with DPW and the contractor on the repair of the sign only until the bulk of the intersection construction is finished. We didn't think it would be wise to uh, put um, a brand new repaired sign if it could be damaged again. Now with the sidewalk installed, I think many of you have seen that at the intersection, it is um, now way more problematic for people to try to park on our lawn. So that's <laughs> kind of the good news is that it seemed like they had to break all our signs before they were protected. But um, we are hopeful that this won't happen again. Um, you know, I, I've spoken with Karen Galligan and she, um, you know, this isn't her fault. This wasn't the DPW crew that caused this damage, but Karen has been in touch with the contractor and she has been great at coordinating. So. so the contractor is going to make good 100% of the damage? Yeah, they, they, have, um, they have filed an insurance claim and it, it will be replaced. Okay, good. It looks like it's it, what, what I got from the vendor, because I contacted the sign vendor, is that um, I think their insurance claim has to pay for direct replacement. So I know there was a question about changing the pillars. We could do that, but we would have to independently do that they will only, um, as an insurance claim, replace what's already there, if that makes yeah. sense. Right. And the vendor is recommending that both pillars be replaced because um, as many people now know, the pillars are not actual bricks. Many people thought they <laughs> were because you were supposed to think they are because it's sort of a faux material. Um, it's really sort of painted uh, pl a plaster type material they need to match the paint. So they can't just send one pillar, they have to do two. So um, it looks like the middle of the sign can be salvaged. So it's not gonna be like they're replacing all of the pieces. Okay, so, oh, there was a window broken uh, in the teen room. We have uh, put some plexiglass over it because John has a lot of plexiglass is the good news. So um, we were able to just, you can see where the rock went through the window. It looks, our, our likely guess, it doesn't look like vandalism. The hole is too small and it was directly in the middle of the window. It really looks like a rock or a piece of pavement somehow ricocheted off a lawnmower. So Marguerite uh, came to sign bills this week and she saw the damage. It's I always think it looks bigger than it is, but it's it's fairly tiny. They they put plexiglass over it because they can't replace the individual panes. The good news about this is the facade restoration project will repair this damage <laughs> because it's part of the original building because the windows are part of the teen room. So so even though there was an, I have to report even more damage to the building, which seems like is the new thing I do every meeting, at least this will, the, we have a plan in place to repair this. So that's the good news. So this is one less insurance hassle for you. Then. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Um, and then we, I don't have a date yet again. So I'm sorry, I feel like I'm telling you all the plans and not giving you time frames. but John and I met um, and we involved some of the facilities team we look at um, the logistics of plexiglassing the circulation desks. So they have to do some custom pieces because I don't know how, how much you guys know about our circulation desks, but there are thinner areas and then there are thicker. So he's got sort of these ones he used at the townhouse that are pre-cut and they have bottoms um, that, that sort of sit um, on the desk, but there needs to be a certain um, 
width of the desk. So he's going to have to do the width at the end where the desk is wider, but they were very confident that they could get that done. It's just a matter of um, ordering the plexiglass and then um, cutting it if they have to. So uh, they were estimating about three to four weeks. So that was, I think I met with them about a week and a half to two weeks ago. So I'm not holding them to that. They have a lot of, um, you know, they repaired our sign. They did that before the end of the summer, which was really great. So the facilities team is great. They, um, they maximized the amount of time that they spend on projects during the day. I'm, I'm hoping that sort of by mid to late September, we'll have plexiglass. Desks. We are not doing that in the team room um, just because the dimensions of the desk is so small down there. Um, it doesn't make sense. So we want to designate the team room as a potential staff work area. Um, the uh, plexiglass is targeted for upstairs and the children's room. So those are the two areas we're talking about doing. Any questions? Programs and outreach? I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. We're continuing with some, but not all virtual programs. Mm -hmm. We did do our first, and it turns out only, um, in-person summer reading program. We did a baby yoga um, uh, outside, which was with Mandy Robert, who does our craft programs. So we had about 10 people register and uh, two people on the wait list. We told waitlist people they could come the morning of. We got one waitlisted person and we got five people to show up. So it ended up just being six families. Um, we made sure that we measured everything. Um, they were wearing masks. Mandy was wearing a mask. It was very successful. So before the temperature changes, we're going to try to add more. Um, we don't know how many more yet. Um, Kim is on vacation this week. We were trying to set up some potential dates with Mandy, and then we'll have to do some rain dates because if it rains outside, we will obviously won't be able to do it. So um, other than that, I mean, our virtual program attendance is not like our in-person program attendance. We are not getting the same numbers as you can imagine. So I don't, we tried to do a little bit more in the summer because we know that um, people were out of school or they were looking for something to do. I think generally we found that people wanted to be outside and um, you know spend that time. We got some of that feedback. We are continuing craft programs through October. I mentioned the SEF um, program that we have funded. I'm coordinating with the vendor to do that in November um, so that we'll have an additional craft program. Um, and then we're out of grant money after that. So we have to talk to the friends if they want to continue. They did indicate at their last meeting that they would be um, interested in a proposal on, on continuing craft programs into next year and then at the beginning of next year. So we will, um, Kim and I will probably sit down and map out exactly what we want to do and then um, see if they want to fund it. Okay, questions, anybody? No? All right, library service updates. We are expanding curbside pickup service. Uh, so this is, even though we've, we've been doing it and this is the second day um, until 5.30, this is our official announcement. So I'm glad you guys are part of that. We are working on some information that we're gonna put out on social media and we're updating the website to reflect the change. We are also, people are very excited, adding Saturdays. Um, so traditionally the library has opened physically um, on Saturdays in September. So even though the first Saturday often falls on Labor Day weekend, we do have staff that will be coming in this weekend and offering curbside pickup. So it's only gonna be on Saturdays from 10.30 to 4.30. So there's just a uh, six hour window. But we need time to set the tables up in the morning and people don't come in until right at 10 and then they need time to break it down before they leave. So we'll, as, as we have been, we will try to be flexible. But um, many people who are, we've tried to work with people who um, I know have full-time jobs and are still having to go into work. 
Um, you know, they, they often send family members uh, to pick up for them. Now they can schedule times on Saturday and pick up then. So not too many people have taken us up on it, but we are gonna announce on Saturday that we're offering it on Saturday. So we think we're gonna get a lot of calls that day. <laughs> so imagine. Uh, and then the going until 5.30 is on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Those are the nights traditionally that the library was open. Kim and I did discuss and we talked with um, Emily and John. Uh, so Emily and Miko, the public health nurse and John Parent uh, from facilities. We decided uh, not to do an evening pickup. Sometimes I, I do facilitate meetings or I do stay later. If a patron has a, a specific request or they can't get here until the evening, they can contact me and we'll try to work something out. I don't mind staying a little bit. I always, as you can imagine, have things to do here. So, um, but generally we're trying to push people to Saturday because we think that will be, you know, we have a full staff that day. So it's a little bit easier to coordinate. Ryan, what are your thoughts about when the weather starts to get too cold to do curbside outside? We have, a, we have a lot of thoughts on that. So we have, John and I have talked about everything from some sort of outside extension of yep. the front entrance to reconfiguring the hallway space that leads to the children's room inside mm -hmm. to sort of have a, many libraries like Hopkinton, for example, have lobbies that or lobby spaces that they can configure and then sort of cordon off the rest of the library. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. So that's part of our geographic limitation, but we are kind of gonna reconfigure that, that hallway when you walk in downstairs to almost mm -hmm. be like a lobby. It's just gonna be a very um, narrow space. So trying to set up tables there at the same time is gonna be a challenge but John and I are up for the challenge of figuring out exactly how that's gonna work. So people will still have to um, use the door. That's the big thing we're trying to figure out. So we don't know if, um, you know, even if they're using the ADA switch, they have to touch it. So it, it will, people will have to enter through the door and just, you know, we'll try to keep sanitizing the door. Why I does it have to be inside just because it's cold? It doesn't have to be. We, I just, I, I guess I'm concerned about the staff going in and out of the building so much if it is colder outside. I mean, I, I'm more concerned about the snow and the ice, I would say specifically. That's, I don't really want people running bags out all the time if they could trip. Or no, I get that, but I don't think like, I mean, if really in the wide picture, I think it's mostly just the cold. Um, and can't you just do, I mean, I guess I'm thinking they don't need to be running out. Couldn't, I, I wonder like if it might be more, um, this is, I'm not working there. So, but I'm thinking like, can't you have like a, they go out, there's the full, like two or three, four hour windows of, you know, pick up and drop off. So whoever, like, you know, if Kim and I work in the library, Kim Regan, like sh she packs up the 10 to two ones and takes them out at 10 and then either there's a 12 to four or whatever. And then, you know, so you're not having to go in and out. There's like two or three times that people go out rather than every time one's filled or something like that. And we certainly have tried to do it that way. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know how you're doing. I'm just saying like, if you did, then they wouldn't be going in and out as much. I'm just trying to figure out how to make it easier. So you're not having to have doors to worry about people. I understand if it's snowing or whatever, but seems like our last winters have been just a matter of cold if that so anyway so john, john and i are confident that we could set it up so that it would be safe and that we could section off the rest of the building in a way that makes sense so i, I think we'd like to try interior pickups i mean i again the, i think the eventual goal here is to look at a, a in whatever form it takes ultimately a a reopening right so i, I don't i I don't think we're going to be fully reopened. I mean, it tends to be that libraries across the state are offering 30 minute windows of people coming in. Generally staff are not directly checking out books. They're only using <clears throat> self checkout materials or they're setting up their search stations so that people can hold uh, library cards and books up to scanners. You know, we're looking at those different models. The first step is to plexiglass the desks 
so that the staff are somewhat insulated and we could set up scanners. Um, and then we'll kind of look at how we could configure the space. I also need to meet with um, Chief Achilles again, because we talked about, you know, everybody loves those, but those arrows on the floor that would direct um, the people traffic in a specific manner. So as unpopular, I think, as those are in a retail environment and in other libraries, we would have to do that because we have so many narrow entrances, even upstairs, that seems more open. If you think about it, the access from the uh, addition to the newer part is actually through old windows. So you're sort of like going through like a large window space. It's not designed as sort of a big open uh, door. So we're going to have to um, direct people, if that makes sense. So I, 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 to your point, Amy, we might be able to continue in the winter. We didn't have a lot of snow last winter. So, you know, I will say setting up the tents probably is going to be a lot less fun in the winter for, for all of us. Um, I, I also don't know if curbside is going to be as popular in the winter as it is now. So it's like we need a drive through window. <laughs> or, you know, setting up, could we even, John and I have even talked about this, but can we set something out in the parking lot um, that we could bring the bags to and have them available at specified times? I mean, it's clear that when the winter comes, we're going to have to make some modifications. So right. we're kind of talking through all of that and then seeing what shape that would take. But, you know, Westboro is now allowing uh, members of the public into their building at specified times to browse, and Ashland is too. Um, most of our area neighbors are not, um, but I am talking a lot with Paula and with Maureen in their respective communities about what is working and what isn't. So, you know, there have not been, it's not just them, you know, I've talked to the director, and I know I've mentioned this, the director in Charlton, the directors in Pepperell and Milford, there have not been massive problems and there have not been uh, residents who are not complying with the guidelines that the library is putting forth. And generally our patrons in Southborough are amazing. And I don't think that we get a lot of problems if we do look at some sort of model where we let people in. We're definitely setting up appointments. If people are interested in accessing library resources, they can talk to me and we just have to figure out what they need and how long it would take and how to make sure they can do that safely. But I'm working on it, I guess is my, <laughs> my, final, my final statement. It is possible, Amy, just, just to say, devil's advocate that we might just continue doing curbside the same way in the winter that we are now. That's not off the table. I just think we're going to have to maybe make a change, especially when it gets really cold. Like when we're talking January, that's, you know. No, I get it. I was just trying to think, I give as many options as possible and then you can do whatever works best. Um, the only thing left in the director's report was my um, request to see if it would be permissible to purchase canopy tents out of our state aid funds. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to have a discussion. You were able to look at the proof and the quote. So it's the vendor that the Southboro Recreation uses. Um, there are tents that we could get potentially that are less expensive, but um, I really want to get a quality product that's going to last a while. I think it's good because the tents that REC is going to be using are the tents that the library, they look kind of similar. So if we had to set up for like a community event and our tents are side by side, it's kind of nice because they're the same general dimensions. Um, you know, our tent is branded a little bit, so it has our logo and our website, which I always think people need to go to our website. So I think that's some good advertising. We we obviously want to use these for COVID um, curbside pickup now, but there's applications to use these for many things in the future. Everything from summer nights to maybe these movie programs that, that Tim Davis really wanted to do to even potentially events in schools if we want to do a, a setup. 
Kim and I have um, sort of briefly discussed, Kim Ivers and I, doing something outside every, annually every year. Um, so this would be a, a really great addition, we think. So we'd like to purchase two. We used two um, this summer because we had a curbside pickup and a summer reading table. You know, if, if it's, they're not cheap. They're about $1,200 a pop. So if you wanted to do one for right now and see how we make that work, that would also be okay. Ryan, would you be able to pop the uh, diagram up on, by screen sharing? Yeah, if you, I just need a minute to open it in my email. Okay. And you did ask the friends for this, yes? We did have a discussion. They want me to come back to an October meeting with uh, quotes from different vendors. That will be, yeah, that's too late by so. then. Well, it's too late. What do you mean? Well, if he's trying to use them in for the fall, um, for the fall pickup and things like that, by the time they approve it, and then he orders them, it's we're looking at winter time probably. So you're, um, you're asking the friends to to pay for the tent. Is that what I'm hearing? We had requested that the friends um, uh, give funding for this, and they wanted us to get quotes from different vendors. Okay. So. Ryan, what's the turnaround time between when you order it and when it's finished and delivered to us? I would have to contact the vendor and ask them that. I, my understanding is that Recreation got theirs pretty quick, but they were not purchasing it um, during COVID. I will say um, they're probably, they were probably pretty busy, the vendor, in the summer, because mm -hmm. I think everybody was doing this. I don't know about the fall. I don't know if, if people are still buying them in the same volume. I can see a lot of uses for them in addition to the COVID, um, you know. I mean, even the friends could use them for their book sales and bake sales and. <laughs> you have a canopy tent already that they set up for Heritage Day. I mean, Heritage Day, you yeah. know, is, is another application. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are often sort of times that I have to do like a moat setup, if that makes sense. And this would be nice because we'd essentially have something to set up under. Um, and especially if it's sort of not a not nice day or it's raining, you know, Pat or and I. Uh, you, go ahead. <laughs> were you, were you going, I, are you trying to put it up? The picture I saw was yellow with the turquoise logo on it. Is that yes, and that is um, changeable if you guys don't uh, like that. So Ryan, the yellow, is that part of your branding for the live? Could you get it, could you get it in, in white with the blue? Yep, not could. yellow. We, could. Uh, we did that just because we wanted to differentiate from the rec tents a little bit. Um, it is very yellow. I'll say that. It was it's a very yellow. Yeah, it is it up or? <laughs> it's very yellow. Just an opinion from here. I don't see a picture of it. Is no, that up? It he up put, he sent it, it out. Was it, on the, it was a, an attachment to his email. Yeah, we're just trying to screen share it, but yeah. this may oh. be more trouble than it's worth, Ryan. Maybe, maybe, maybe forget I'm, about I'm it. I'm pulling it up now. I yeah, just have it on the email. I just. Okay. Are you putting up with the KD Canopy uh, Company out of Denver? Yeah. yeah. Here, look. Here it is. Suggesting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Where's my camera? Here it is. I know. <laughs> Can you oh, see the it? pandas are getting okay. in the way. Get those pandas out of there. <laughs> you can modify the background. There it is. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it would actually, it would be more consistent with the rec tent. Again, we just wanted to try to, generally we do use blue and yellow um, mm. if we're going to pick two colors for things. Um, but we, we've done different colors depending on the item. So if you like white better, our, our concern about white was that it, they could get dirty and we just have to clean them more often. But honestly, I don't think there's much of a difference with the yellow. But the yellow is going to show as much as, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know. Is there an extra charge for the color, Ryan? No, uh, no. it's going to be the same charge if we do a custom printing anyway. Mm -hmm. To think put our logo and the library, oh. uh, the library website, it will be um, that there's a charge for that because they're doing a custom print. But the fact that there's a different color doesn't really matter. If it's white or yellow, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Are you looking? Are you looking for a motion? I mean, it sounds like we need to do this uh, post haste. You don't need to vote. I just wanted to know if I could buy it. I mean, it's helpful to know if you guys all agree that white is better. Oh, I. 
I'm happy to change that and the proof with the vendor. Actually, I didn't think I'd like the yellow, but I think your point that you'll stand out a bit from the rec department since makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't originally for the branding. I didn't know why, but I act, I, I agree with it. You know, after you, after seeing the um, rec department ones and I think this is great. I think you'll know exactly where you're going. You can say, go find the yellow tent as opposed to all the white ones that are usually um, up at these kind of things. But that's my opinion. Ryan, do you have any pictures or just how visible will the logo be since it's on the top of the tent? That's just something to consider. I don't know if they have any like, um, you know, real life pictures um, to, that renders how a logo would be on like the, the top portions, um, just to make sure that it's what you expect. Yeah, it will be slanted on an angle. So it's going to be, you know, if you're if you're flying in a plane overhead, it'll be very visible. <laughs> yes, but, um, but so, so for instance, at, at Heritage Day, would you be able to see the... You the will be logo? able to see it from sort of far back, but as you get up close to the tent, Kim is exactly right. So, you know, I think people driving by is the idea with curbside would be able to see the library logo, but if you're driving directly, like next to the tent, um, when people come to pick up, they won't. So it's, you know, how important is custom branding? You know, to me, it is important that when we purchase an item, we, we let people know that it is the library. You know, if I had to pick logo versus um, website, the website is really what we want to promote because we want people going there because there's information about what's going on. Um, so there's a curbside guide that I think a lot of, a lot of people maybe didn't see that, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, would be helpful if people went to the website. But I like to have our logo on everything so people know that it was a designated library item. Um, you know, again, I can modify the proof. I can have the vendor do that. I think having it on the top like that is the best. Um, I sent them the logo and then they sent me the proof to try to figure out the best place for it. So putting it right on the top like that. Right have their logo in the same space. I was gonna say, if you've ever been to Heritage Day, I. Um, I've had to work them with my Girl Scouts for an eternity now, but they like the dent, like the orthodontist and stuff. As you're walking down the center, you know, if you're in the center, you can pretty much see the angle, that part of it. Um, it's just, you know, if you're like under it, you can, can't, but you can pretty much see the logos on those, at least the, all the ones that I remember, you know, being by or walking near. Uh, we were across the path from, um, as a bit last year and you could see there I could you could see there's just you know how the width of the, uh, the walkways at Heritage Day if that helps at all. Gotcha. I do have one last question Ryan it says in the quote that it comes with stakes um, which is great if you're installing it on the grass. Um, I assume for curbside pickup you'd probably be installing it on the pavement. Does it come with weights or anything else like that to prevent it from flying away? So it does not, but I have looked into that as sort of a local solution and it Ocean State Goblot does sell specific tent weights that we could look at. We've been using sort of smaller, smaller but kind of heavy rocks. Um, there's been a lot of um, construction, as you guys know, at the intersection and then small pieces of pavement to kind of weight down the tents. The, the benefit of using this vendor versus other vendors is also we've used, been using the rec tent all summer and they're gonna want it back eventually, but it has not blown over on windy days because it's so sturdy. And then we really know the product we're getting. We've, we've had the staff been setting this up and using this the whole time. So, you know. This is in fact a little more solidly built than the rec tent, correct? If it's the one I saw. The, it's, the same, it's going to be the same aluminum uh, right. pillars and everything. So I didn't even know it came with the stakes. I mean, the stakes would be helpful if we set up in the field for Heritage Day, if we're even allowed to put stakes in it. You're, you're required not only to stake, but I believe you have to weight it too. And uh, like Kim's, I think they make, they make weights and we should probably use those just for liability of it blowing <laughs> out into, you know. But yes, um, the state, I, they require because I think if you recall a couple of years ago at Heritage Day, a big gust of wind came and through a bunch of the tents they do require, but I think double. 
<laughs> double suspenders, so to speak. So oh, a dangerous ten. Yeah, I remember that because I was here that year. Um, <laughs> they, the the friends wanted, I think, us to explore more affordable options, but uh, I'll just say I, we selected this tent because we liked it. I'm saying we, I did, but I talked to kids. Get what you pay for too, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying with the cost of getting two. I think it makes sense to get them both at the same time yeah. so they match for branding and everything. And just looking at the cost compared to what we have in state aid, it would be less than 4% of yeah. our state aid budget. I, I so agree. I think it's a no brainer. So yeah, um, we need to decide on the color. Is that the thing? Is that what's happening here? I think Ryan, you've got it right. The yellow, or you guys don't like the yellow? Uh, I'm okay question, with the yellow. My question is, Jane, can you live with the yellow? Not okay with the yellow, but you can <laughs> outvote me. <laughs> well, I would just say, like, if, if it's part of your branding, like, I mean, there's no yellow on the website, but your tablecloths are like a lighter color yellow, um, if that's what you're going for. Might be too much yellow. Right, so. I think yellow is a happy color. And I think, like I said, like being able to say, go to the yellow tent as opposed to all the other ones are white um, is will be useful, frankly, but that's. I think for outside the library, the yellow would be more attention getting. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, cause if somebody's looking for the pickup location and they don't actually know where it is, that's gonna kind of shout. Yes, yeah, it will well, look like a COVID testing tent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one other question. On this quote sheet, it has a ship date of May 13th, 2023. Was that just the error? So the, we didn't have, they didn't update the quote date. That was the one from REC because okay. we worked with the same sales rep. So okay. I just said, really what we're looking for is like a library version of the REC 10. So okay. she, because we didn't, I told her that we didn't have funding yet. So she um, didn't go through the process. The, the quote is like a, dr a draft of a quote, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I told her, I actually told her I'd be in touch with her earlier than I have been because I, I thought the friends would approve this. So, you know, when the friends asked me to get more quotes, I did say I was going to broach the purchase of the tents with you guys. So they're aware of that. They, I yeah. said, you know, we might find the money out of state aid just to let you know. And they were okay with that. Mm -hmm. So um, this won't be a surprise, I think, when we go back and we sort of, um, you know, give them an update. Yeah. Okay, so um, do we have, do we want to discuss more or shall um, we move to purchase two tents out of state aid? You, you can vote, you don't have to, just as a reminder. It doesn't hurt. Okay. All right, go ahead and motion. Okay, I move that we purchase the. All right. Oh, he must be a librarian. He's very precise with his language. Okay, I move that we Thank purchase you. two tents as presented out of state aid and pay for them out of state aid. I second. All in favor alphabetically? Uh, Jane? Uh, Davis, <laughs> uh, yes, I. Poor guy. Oh. Landry, I. Amy, I. Regan, I. Yes, Donnie, I. Okay, passes unanimously. All right, we've got two tents in the works. Um, and now the financial report. Uh, sure. I, there's other than the fact that we've essentially spent our entire computer budget. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 you saw that. So we, we purchased replacement PCs and that kind of wiped out, um, that wiped out the whole thing. So, uh, you know, we're just gonna treat our computers right over the next- Ryan, um, could you just quickly go over the dues and subscriptions, which are two areas where it was much higher than usual? Is it just the front loading of um, those fees? Yes, so um, you're seeing a large amount of money um, being deducted from the dues because we do our annual consortium payment. Um, we usually pay it in either late July or early August. So that is our membership fee to CW Mars. So that is what, um, that's actually most of the dues it, right there. And then with the subscription costs, we paid uh, the majority of our um, annual subscriptions 
to W.T. Cox, which are the, our subscription vendor that manages all the periodicals and newspapers that come to the library. So uh, just to let you know, um, W.T. Cox did uh, suspend some of the subscriptions because of the pandemic. So we've majorly been getting everything. We've even had people ask for magazines and curbside pickup. They've been a lot more popular than I thought. So, um, and then the newspapers, we are still receiving the staff actually like reading on their lunch break. So I like to say that they're still getting used. Um, mm. So that that's why that's the majority of those costs. The trick, we try to um, pay those two items as much as possible in, at early in the year, early in the fiscal year, so that we can get things on an annual recurring cost. Some of the things were purchased um, at different times of the year and the vendors kind of keep us to that billing cycle. So I, I always try to um, engage with the vendors and see what we can, um, if we can move things to July as much as possible. But Frigo will come up in like March, for instance, because we purchased that um, when the pandemic started. So we'll, you know, we'll have to make a decision depending on the amount of money we have if we want to continue. It's been getting a lot of usage. So that's the good news, but we should see if that continues, I would say for the next few months. Yeah, good. Any other questions about the financial report? We oh, also, for the record, have spent more on books than we normally would have right now, if you guys have an eye for that. And that's only because we didn't buy books for a while, and then we bought a lot of books all at once. So mm -hmm. we're still well within, I think, our limit, and I'm, I'm confident about um, the amount of money we have for the rest of the year. But if you guys are looking month to month, it does look like we've spent a lot of money on books. And that was really because we had to purchase all of the April, May, June books we had to wait until July. So that's, that's why. Okay. Um, while I'm thinking of it, could you please thank John Parent and his team for fixing the white sign? <laughs> they did a great job. They did do a good job. If you guys are um, driving by or you have a chance to stop by the library, it's worth taking a look. You can notice where the bulk of the repair work was done, but I think if you're driving by or from far away, unless you're looking for the repair, you don't see it. So I think that's exactly, um, you know, they, they saved us $4,500. So we really should, uh, they deserve the praise. Yes, yes. Uh, whoever the person was who did that, was it John who did it or was it somebody else? Um, it was it was members of his team. Members of his team. Well, Frank, Frank, and um, there's a new facility staff member who's great too. Well, hats off to them, really. Yes. Okay. So, um, did we deal with status of COVID nineteen building reopening, or do we need to go back to that, or where are we? No, we kind of. I did kind of address that with the plexiglass. We're not planning at this point to reopen in September because mm -hmm. we're waiting for the um, boiler. Uh, installation, the EMS installation, and the plexiglassing of the desks. So once we do that, the next step is figuring out how we could safely integrate members of the public, whether or not to look at a by appointment model versus just kind of letting the doors open. You know, I, again, I'm talking a lot with uh, Maureen in Westboro because they're limiting the specific times that they're letting people come in. So um, maybe that might be something we do. Um, okay. I have a question. If if we do let public in, does, do they have to be self-row residents? We, so we cannot restrict that. Okay. It has to. That's a problem that now we have a hotspot in the town next door. And yeah. So, so I, I was hoping in September we would be kind of farther along. Yeah. So you're, you're hitting it, Janet. We're not. So um, I sat down and I, I talked, I sat down on my desk on my phone and talked to Emily because we don't, we don't we often talk in person. Um, but so Emily and Miko, the public health nurse, um, at the time we were kind of looking at a September opening a couple weeks ago. Um, that was her concern because her focus was on schools, as you can imagine, and coordinating with the educational institutions. Um, when you are talking about a, a primary or, or even like a secondary school, right? like a, a public school with younger kids, it's regionally based. Mm -hmm. So the kids who go to a Southboro school are all in Southboro, right? When you're talking about a public library, 
especially like a program like story time, we sometimes have members from four or five different communities yep. within a group of 20 people. So, so I, I don't, you know, Emily is just concerned about the numbers in some of the neighboring communities. And I echo those concerns. I would just say if we're seeing numbers that are high in Marlboro or in Northboro, that could affect, those people would be able to come in if we're open. Well, and, and if I was a resident of, of Framingham, I wouldn't want my family going to things in Framingham. I would be looking at other towns that were safer for this kind of thing. Where's the hotspot? What do you mean? Framingham. Framingham is one of the state hotspots now. Okay. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like we live in Southboro and there are no grocery stores here. So we're going to other hotspot towns to go grocery shopping. Yeah, we, we're going to Whole Foods in Framingham, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's. Oh, so must be growing in Shrewsbury. <laughs> I, mean, I think it needs to be open to everybody. But, right. you know, instead of just walk in, I think we can control that by having signups so you can at least manage the number of people in the library at a time and feel safer that way for the staff and for. Mm -hmm. patrons and at the same time if there is a sign up then we'll have their name and contact information if we ever need to do any contact tracing. That's a really good idea Kim. That's a really 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 You really said you weren't doing that Ryan because of the whole we don't keep track of people that go in the library. Different libraries are approaching it different ways you know we may um, I, we cannot require it I'll say Kim so I can't I can't make people um, uh, give us their personal information to come in the door. But we can request, we can ask people and see if they would voluntarily opt in. And that is what most uh, libraries that are looking at uh, like a model are doing. And many libraries are looking at a by appointment model specifically for what Kim just suggested, is that there's a way to kind of get back in touch with those people if there's an issue. Or if well, it's also that if, if you'd been somewhere where there was well, there was a case, you'd want to be notified. So why wouldn't you think it was? The LC does not recommend recording the names and personal information of every person who walks through the door, uh, like sort of in an invasive manner. So what about just a phone number? Yeah, I, there's only been one, you can ask for a phone number too. The, they, there's only been one library where um, I think it was in Ashland was the example of a person who objected to providing their name and phone number, and that individual was known to the library staff. So they actually knew who it was. Uh, okay. About it though, if people are going into the library, it's for a limited time to browse and presumably check out materials. So isn't it reasonable that they probably have a library card in which we would have their phone number because it's part of the registration? Um, I mean, nobody should be coming to the library for their 30 minute block just to hang out. <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe sneeze and <laughs> would want to, but I think that's not the intention of reopening. We haven't gotten a lot of requests. You're, and you're exactly right, Kim. We haven't gotten a lot of requests for people to come into the building until this week. And it was actually surprisingly younger people. And I think what's happening, because I've talked to my, my fellow directors, is that uh, college students who are doing virtual sessions are looking for a place to study or to do things that are not their house. So they're looking at public libraries, but mm -hmm. this is exactly the reason why some of the colleges have gone virtual is so that they don't congregate as, as groups. So I would say my one, you know, there are other services that we would look at offering. One is our public PCs for internet access if people wanted to use it for that. And then normally I would say the copy machine, which we don't currently have available to the public because we don't have it available to us. You know, the other um, permissible reason I can immediately think of is faxing. So- See, both of those, they're staples. I don't see that as a justification at all, but we've yeah. had the discussion before. I just don't see why, um, yeah. Could I? Could I um, interrupt this just briefly? Um, Kim, what time do you have to leave the meeting? Um, sooner rather than later, but if, if we think we're closer to wrapping up, I'm fine to stay on for another 10 minutes. Okay, good. Could, so could I just, I know David Eckberg, our new trustee, um, 
this would go under any other business that shall probably come before the board. And Kim, I'd sort of like to hear what you have to say on this one. Um, had an, and had an idea that he um, mentioned to me. And um, David, do you want to uh, take it sure. from here? Uh, those of you, I guess we all get in South Row, we all, all get this weekly uh, little uh, paper called the Community Advertiser. Um, and Mandy Advocate. So yeah, you're thank you. I stand corrected. That's yeah. okay. No, I just yeah. wanted to make sure everybody was on the and same. Some of you may have noticed this, but I think it was in June. Uh, there was a letter to the editor, quite a long letter, multiple paragraphs, and it was over the, wasn't over individual signatures, but it was simply signed by the Westboro uh, Board of Trustees of the, of the Westboro Library. And it, what it was, was a, a piece, uh, fairly strongly worded uh, piece, uh, showing support for uh, Black Lives Matter. And I, it kind of jumped off the page at me because it raised a, you know, a, a philosophical question, frankly, as to whether a library uh, with the benefit of a sort of a, a bully pulpit, in a way, uh, should be taking a stand on public issues, uh, or looking at it the other way, how apolitical should we be? I've discussed this just briefly with, uh, with Marguerite and um, with Brian, and uh, bring it up just uh, because I, I, I don't um, I don't necessarily uh, advocate for it. Uh, on the other hand, I think the question is fairly raised, and uh, I, I bring it up to, simply to see what kind of uh, feedback or feelings uh, the rest of you might have. Hmm. So I do have a little bit of background just on, on the Westboro Library doing the, their board. It's the board of trustees from the Westboro Library. Um, did um, you know sort of create and adopt a, a Black Lives Matter statement? Um, the, give you background if you're not familiar with this. The ALA released a statement, as did the MBLC, and so the Westboro just kind of took that um, locally and sort okay. of did their own. So that that is not something I shared this with David. It's not something many library boards are doing, but West, our neighbors did it in Westboro. And if that is something that you wanted to do, um, you can. So. Any thoughts? Well, I certainly think that the library should be apolitical. You know, stay out of all that because you should have some public spaces where you don't have to worry about people haranguing <laughs> you about things. But Black Lives Matter is a different kind of thing. I don't, I, I guess I feel like anybody who's put off by it would, I have a problem with them. <laughs> but, but that might just, but that might be too narrow thinking as well. I don't Generally know. the ALA and the MBLC do not release uh, political statements too. Right. I don't think they're viewing the issue as political. Mm -hmm. No. So, Marguerite, what's the intention right now? Is it to just get this conversation started, or are we looking to, um, you know, take a vote on whether the board as a whole wants to put together a statement? What are you thinking in terms of timeline? That's very interesting. I think kind of opening a conversation. Um, would we, the options were letter to the community advocate or statement on our website or single banner on our website or how people would feel about that. Because I agree with Janet, this isn't a political issue. This is a, an American issue mm -hmm. and we're an American institution. And um, I don't think anyone in this country is untouched by the current situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, it's, uh, it's a place to, um, well, to think about to think about it and to say, well, can we add, can we add something to this discussion that would um, help mm -hmm. all of us to bring the country to a better place? Yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, I, I support that and support us finding um, kind of the right way for us to do that with the platform that we have. Um, you know, it's a public library and I feel like we need to support the things that are going on. And I agree, it's not political. I feel like it's, you know, a, 
a, a general issue. Um, and I'm happy to support that. So I think it sounds like we maybe just need to think about how we want to do that. I don't receive the community advocate. So uh, after this meeting, I'll look up and try and find that. It's um, online to read. Um, I have a question. David, when you saw that, was Sorry, that... I have to go. I needed to go at two, and it sounds like this is going to keep going, so I have to go. My daughter's orientation is now, so... Okay, you'll be able to watch the recording. It'll be fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks, Amy. Jane, what's um, your question, please? I was wondering, you, you brought it to our attention. What was your initial reaction when you read it? Were you in well, I, I was surprised, frankly. I was surprised because I hadn't thought this through before. I mean, I'm a rookie here, right? And I, I, I was surprised that, um, that a board of trustees would take what I read to be a, a fairly strong position on an, on an issue which, uh, you know, you can make pretty good arguments on, on both sides. So it raised a question to me as to, you know, whether, whether t making a public statement is, is at all within the purview of what we're supposed to be doing, or should we just be sticking to our knitting? Right, okay. I mean, so, I think it's up to us as a board to, to make that decision. Um, I'm not sure that this meeting <laughs> is when it's no, gonna- No, this is opening it up, really. This yeah. is starting it off, yeah. This yeah, is a yeah. two or three glass wine, glasses of wine conversation. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I follow a bunch of libraries on social media, and you know, I, I personally would like to see more support of, you know, promoting books and resources um, to support this issue um, through the library. Ryan, I don't know what your stance is on that because I haven't seen, you know, a, a ton of that coming through the library social media. Well, you probably will see a lot more now after we started this discussion. So on over, we did receive a book list from some local college students. And then we kind of went through a collection. We looked at books that we already had a lot of the books, which was that made me feel kind of good, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, um, so it was uh, from African American authors, and then it was sort of books that pertain to the Black experience. So we did look at potential collection holes, and we we bought some books um, when we were buying books in July, um, which actually coincided with some of the intersection protests on Route 30 and 85. So they're kind of almost right in front of the library. Um, and then Overdrive, the, the CW Mars Overdrive modified uh, some of the front page so that there were Black Lives Matter oriented books. So again, African-American um, authors and sort of books about the Black experience that were um, sort of front and center um, as people went so they could get suggestions on those. I mean, we did definitely see an uptick in people requesting those books. Um, and they often didn't have to wait because we had them in the collection. We are looking at different ways to do collection highlights. Um, and honestly, one of the big things is brainstorming what the themes would be. So this might be a good way um, to sort of engage with members of the staff and have them use some of the book list that we provided and then talk about titles that are in our collection and what are the things that you can get here. Mm -hmm. So, um, You'll see more, I guess, Kim. I, I, I again, we didn't. I, I am sort of, I guess, cautious about doing doing things that are too political or do too statement driven. But if this is something the board um, is supportive of, and it's something I'm personally supportive of, I, I think it's a good idea to to go in that direction. So we might be a little bit late. We might we're a little bit behind Westboro, but I don't think that's a bad thing. So I mean, I don't I don't think you can be too late to enter. Um, <laughs> And I mean, generally, I personally would like to see more um, promotion of books, um, you know, surrounding people of color in general and with more cultural diversity. And I know that we do have a ton of these books in the library. And I've heard from other people that they come to our library specifically because we have such a diverse collection, especially in the children's level. So I think we have it and we're doing it, but, you know, we're not, you know, as overly promoting it, um, which is maybe something we could improve or find ways to um, just get it out there more. Mm -hmm. We always need to market ourselves better. You know, we're doing the work and sometimes we're too in the weeds, I think. So it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I will work on that. That is a good suggestion. So. Right. right. I'm sorry. I have to jump off now. Um, have fun. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.
So I, oh, Marguerite, I know, funny, funny enough, I know you wanted to talk about the standardized meeting time. You guys still have quorum, so you can keep going until another one yeah. leaves. Uh, <laughs> yes. I have announcements after you're done. Okay, this will be so quick. Um, I would really love to um, pick up, we, we're going to be doing Zooms for the foreseeable future, that's from the townhouse. Um, and I would like to find a specific time of day and a day of the month to do it every time so that we don't have to do the doodle pull scramble every time. Um, so maybe I could send her out a doodle poll or Ryan could send her out a doodle poll with times that you could sort of make it every month. Well, couldn't um, we sort of stick to the schedule we had? You put one out for, you know, the second Tuesday, Tuesday at 6 Yeah, and here we are on Wednesday. Yeah, during the day, which obviously for at least two uh, of our right. committee are, it's a slight conflict. So what was right. wrong with staying with the, because we, I think, I know David you're, and Janet, you're relatively new, but we kind of had a schedule as our standard. It was usually time. the first Tuesday night of the month. Yeah, it's okay. the third, third Tuesday. Third Tuesday. And, now, and then it was the third Tuesday night of the month. Okay. But so I mean, we, something like that, which is kind of, um, well, if we just knew that and not have to. I agree. Month Please, to month. You, have, you have no idea how much I agree with you on that. Um, it's like, and as, as much as I personally didn't really like the six o'clock, it made perfect sense when we were done by 7.30 or eight o'clock. So All right. So do you want to go why for... Why I would vote for something, no no more doodles. <laughs> yes, thank you. Doodle <laughs> hell, please, my life. Okay, so what about um, the third Thursday of every month at 6 p.m.? Why did you say Thursday? Do you, so, you don't mean Tuesday? No. Tuesday is the Board of Selectmen. Yeah, so t that's, that's, um, that's for me more than Marguerite. So Tuesdays Jesus. tend to be the okay. top evening that other boards and committees meet. I so see. Sometimes I need to be in two meetings at once, if that okay. makes sense. Okay, no, I understand. So you prefer Thursday. Is that a better I, time? It, it's any day other than Tuesday. Wednesday or Thursday are a little bit better only because if we file an agenda on a Monday, we mm -hmm. have those days to do it. Mm -hmm. The problem, as you know, Jane, with, with trying to do a Tuesday meeting is you need to make sure that the agenda is filed the Friday before and the townhouse closes by noon. Well, I know, I know that. Uh, that's always a, <laughs> always a fun fact to learn. Um, so does Thursday work for people? Sure. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so third Thursday, that's not hard to remember, two third, THs. Third Thursday. And, uh, sh and now, should we make that for September 24th also? Yes, let's just do it. All right, thank you, Jane, I like your, I like your <laughs> attitude, let's get it done. Well, September 24th would be the fourth Thursday. Oh, okay, whatever. Is Where's it? My oh my <laughs> God, wait a minute. October, oh, September, looking. hold on. September. First, there's one, two, three. Oh, you're right, it's the fourth. So it would have to be the 17th. Okay, good. That's do we that. need a meeting in two weeks? Uh, what do we have to talk about? <laughs> we have to reass reassign the board positions. Yes. We may have an election. I think that's a good idea. Okay. So we want to do the third Thursday, mm -hmm. which will be the 17th every month. Every and month. what time? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. And we have a quorum, so we can even vote. We don't have to vote, do we? You shouldn't vote on meeting times. Because yeah. oh. <laughs> then we're locked in. Then we have to have another vote to change it. All right, what? <laughs> fine. I this is lovely we, that we know where we're going to be the third Thursday of every month. Right. So that's on Zoom with can't. each other. I'm having trouble knowing what day of the week it is. So oh, this really please. doesn't help me at all. <laughs> this is my third Zoom meeting today. It's like, oh my God. Whoa. You have to write it down, Janet. Write it on your, you must have a. a I just put it in. I just put it in. Write it on your hand. I know. Your, oh, the day of the week, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'll bet <laughs> so good. Now we're going to find out that Amy can't do it or Kim can't do it, but so far, so good. We'll deal with that when it happens. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so are, are you guys all set with the meeting? Kind of yes. Okay. So. So, so just the final things, I promise, I know you guys have been on <laughs> for a long time, um, is I am working on the annual statistic report, which is due in October. So I, um, I've been having some staff members help me compile some of the annual statistics, which we thought were going to be easy because we mostly shut down in March. And it turns out it made some stuff more complicated, as you can imagine, especially since we're counting some virtual program statistics. So we did do a lot of virtual programs and we did them right away. So just sort of figuring out and compiling all the amount of programs and the numbers um, we are, Carol Logan has been helping me with that. We're almost done. So uh, Kim is, um, when she comes back from vacation, is going to help me with the children's piece. So um, I'm, Marguerite will probably be signing those um, in the next couple weeks, and then we will um, submit them to the state. So we do that every year uh, for people who are unfamiliar with that. I, if you want a copy of the statistic report, I will send it to you. I typically send it to the board anyway. So even if you don't want our statistics, you usually get it. <laughs> so sorry about that, um, but I'm not sorry. Um, and then I also just wanted to, we've had a, a couple of requests to do outdoor events in the library's parking lot on the weekend. Um, one is gonna be, I think in late September and the Boy Scouts need to do an in-person uh, recruitment uh, for several hours. So they requested to do it at the library because we're going to be, they're going to be in kind of a separate area, if that makes sense. Um, so sort of at the top of the parking lot, they're going to set up a whole thing up there and they're going to, um, you know, have uh, masks on. It's going to be restricted even though it's all outside. So we have coordinated with Emily. We have talked with the town to let them know that they're doing that too. So I've, I've sort of gone um, coordinated with Lori Esposito and the Selectman office. We're all set with that. We are also looking at doing a Girl Scout um, event in October where people would drop off donations. And that is also going to be on site at the library. That's going to be a much smaller scale. But Emily and I have um, sort of communicated what the girls need to do to set up. And they are, they're going to sanitize the stuff that gets donated. Their parents are going to be with them. So I'm just letting you guys, anytime something happens, even if it's not in the library, if it's on the library's property, I like to let you guys know. So there's nothing you have to do about these things. We're making making sure that the, the kids are going to be all um, situated. In the recruitment, it's actually run by the adults. There's going to be members of the, um, the uh, Cub Scout pack there, I guess, who are going to, uh, you can tell, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the Boy Scout, right? The Scout pack? Troop. It's a troop. Okay. So members of like troops. Boys okay. have packs, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the troop is going to be there for the, the Boy Scouts, but they can't have over 50 people. And it's still recommended that they engage in social distancing practicing. So they were going to do this somewhere in town anyway. The library's property kind of lends itself to the event that they wanted to do. So I'm just letting you guys know. Just a quick update. Um, you know, we're still trying to do community partnerships, even though it is a lot more challenging. Um, so we already had a good relationship with our local Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops. We want to make sure that we continue that moving forward. Sounds good. What's the date, Ryan? Sorry. I, I can get you those dates. I don't think it, I don't think it occurs before the next meeting. So I can get, what I'll do is in the next director's report for for two weeks from now. Oh, you guys decided. <laughs> I will have the dates for both of those events in that there. Sounds the, good. That the sounds Girl Scout good. thing is still, um, we're still ironing out the details. They're going to come and do a site visit. We're going to do that socially distanced outside to talk about the best, best place to set up. But um, that is not till October. So we well, got plenty of time in that one. That's good. Good use of our parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other comments, questions? No, we're good. All right. Shall I adjourn the meeting? It is 2.34. And uh, you have to do a roll call vote. Okay, oh I, I move that we adjourn the meeting. How's I'll that? second that one. And okay. I guess, Jane, you're the first voter. Uh, Davis, aye. <laughs> Eckberg, aye. Landry, aye. Janey, aye. 
And we're adjourned. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Jane, can, just can you give me a, a jingle or an email? Okay. What, Thanks. What, about what? Um, I just want to. I just want to ask you about something that has nothing to do with the library at all. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good. I'm going to end the meeting because we're still recording. Oh, all <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.